Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to the Locked On MLB Locked On Diamondbacks crossover for Sunday, July 3rd, 2022. For those of you who are British, I hope you're celebrating the last day you own this place. Oh. I am your host. Paul Francis Sullivan. I am normally the host of Locked On MLB by myself, but every week I get together with my buddy right over there. That's Miller Thomas, the host of Locked On Diamondbacks, and we discuss the events of baseball and try not to make anyone mad. We're going to be breaking down some things today, including the potentially gigantic contract for someone who was born the same year as Miller Thomas. I'm uh-huh. saying this guy might be for now, doing better than Millard financially, but Millard's going to have some time to catch up. We're also going to be talking about the team that won the most games in baseball last year and are now on the outside looking in of an expanded postseason. Also, we have some other topics to talk about, including, is the American League already sewn up? It almost looks that way. Can the Yankees win 120 games? It'll be a stretch, but not as big as a stretch as you'd think it would be. And some other random thoughts that we haven't even thought of yet. But because of the way that we have our show, we sometimes go down certain paths. We'll try to keep this under four hours. Hey, Miller Thomas, where can people follow you? Hey, follow me on Twitter. My personal account is at CreatorThomas24. You can see it there if you're following us on YouTube or just type in Locked on Dimebacks, both Twitter and Instagram in that little search bar. I'm sure you can find the podcast handle. And you can find me, uh, find this podcast at Lock.MLB Pod. Same handle for Instagram and on Twitter. I'm your pal Sully, as you can see right down there. My Twitter handle is Sully Baseball. And I'm on Instagram at Sully Baseball Podcast. Um, we're going to break down a couple of things, but you are the host of Locked On Diamondbacks. I've gotten accused of focusing too much on big market teams, mm-hmm. you know, like I did a whole show recently on the Orioles and the Twins. So naturally, I'm just East Coast, you know, focused. I do want to bring up a question oh, okay. about the Diamondbacks in comparison to one of their division rivals. Now, this is a bit of a long shot, but a lot less of a long shot than it appeared to be at the beginning of the year. As we're recording this, the Diamondbacks are winning and the San Francisco Giants are losing. What is the possible if, if those scores hold up mm-hmm. only – was it how many games will separate it'll be like five games i think will separate arizona from san francisco what are the chances the diamondbacks could finish ahead of Mm. the division champion from last year who won 107 ball games what are the chances that arizona who while not a a great team Mm -hmm. are certainly moving their way up what could they do? To, could they pass San Francisco? Uh, I don't. I don't love those chances. If you asked me this question three weeks ago, four weeks ago, before the month of June, I might have been on the same boat with you because at that point they were like maybe three games behind San Fran. Like they were really close in the standings, and at certain points, like we were breathing down the neck of San Francisco. But this past month of June has been terrible for the D backs. Their offense has been bad. Their pitching hasn't been great either. And now you look at the D backs. Like yeah, I think they're like six games back in the standings, and I, I'm just not too sure. I'm not sure. I believe in this D backs team. I, I've recorded pods this past week saying we need to recalibrate our expectations it's probably time to stop looking at that wild card race and just it's time to really start focusing on the youth and maybe if some guys increase their trade value maybe we become sellers at the deadline we've discussed maybe massive thumb garner david peralta is on the final year of his contract maybe someone like christian walker i don't think i would move christian walker just because he's so cheap and he's still like only 30 years old so i wouldn't move oh you gotta keep christian christian you gotta keep someone positive on your team good lord you can't pull a cincinnati reds you know, and just and just and sell everyone off, and that yeah, that would be a disaster. Yeah, I don't think moving Christian Walker would be smart, but someone like Madison Bumgarner and David Peralta, I think those would be le- legitimate trade candidates for another team to move. We would want to get off that Madison Bumgarner money, and we got a ton of young pitching in their minor leagues that we could call up. We got a ton of young outfielders too if we move David Peralta. So I think the D backs, I, I don't really love their chances of surpassing the Giants in the standings because I think the Giants are going to do a lot more to try to improve their team over the next couple months and maybe even be buyers at the deadline while I think the D-backs are probably going to go the opposite way with their mentality. Yeah. Um, you know, with that that being said, mm-hmm. 
the San Francisco Giants, the team of my father, um, who had a spectacular year last year and got a, a lousy called third strike to torpedo their playoff hopes last year, um, they're getting a good season out of Jock Peterson. They're actually getting a very good season out of Jock Peterson. They're not getting the same production they would have hoped out of Belt and Yastrzemski. Uh, Gonzalez is hurt. Crawford is hurt. They're getting very good pitching. Webb has pitched very well. Rodon has pitched very well. Wood has pitched okay. I mean, uh, recently he's pitched pretty poorly. Cobb pitched well recently. Junis has pitched well, but he's hurt. Disclafani has pitched well, but or, no, he's, he's, he's hurt now. He pitched well last year. But the my goodness, this team can't hit. They are losing games. They're losing, you know, I know many, many giant fan friends through my times in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they're at a loss because last year, all, every ball dropped in, mm-hmm. every pitcher contributed. And I guess you saw how fragile it was. I thought they were going to have a regression, but a regression from a 107 win, you know, season could still be in the mid nineties. They don't look, they, they look like they're going to be low eighties right now. Now you, you did make a great point that the, the time while the uh, Giants have had a bad month. The uh, Diamondbacks have said, "Hold my beer." Yeah, uh, and um, and are making uh, making a great run for. I mean, they've they had a they had a very good. Um, I mean, they had a good May. They had a winning May. The Diamondbacks did. I think they Stop. were ten and twelve in May. They were like right near five hundred. It was a positive May though. But like they've been bad in June. Um, they've been they've been plumb bad in June. Or May they, they were good. It was the first month they were. 10 and 12 may they were yeah but you know they were at they were at even they were at a winning record in late may let's see what was the Mm -hmm. last time they were above 500 i'm here at baseballreference.com single greatest website in the history of the planet earth yeah um they were above 500 last it was probably like in in late may yeah it was probably like two games above 500 something like that yeah in late may they were above 500 and uh after that day and and visions of wild card dancing in Arizona's yeah, head. That was me. I thought, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know. Was and after- the tab, Sully. We were on the pod. I'm like, hey, first time today. I checked the tab, looked at the standings, and we were close to the Giants um right back then. But, and since then they've had the worst yeah. record in the National League. Okay. <laughs> oh, is, um, it, is it is it might be. I don't uh, think it's yeah, worse, yeah. It's, but since then they're they're if if they win today, they'll be 13 and 21 since then. Um, and the Cubs were 14 and 22. So yeah, that's uh, oh, that's wow. not good. That's ah, not good. That that hurts my yeah. spirit. I didn't know that, Sully. You'd have to break it down for me like that. And the Giants have been even five hundred. So, yeah, I guess this. But you know what? Here's but here's another deal. I'm going to keep throwing deals at you. Okay. What's all right. Deal now? We've established and we've talked about this and we've brought this t- this subject up. There's, I mean, we're there was just basically we're early July, t- and to paraphrase Mayor Vaughn in Jaws. For Christ's sakes, tomorrow's the 4th of July. Mm-hmm. Now, um, we're looking up at it's the 4th of July, and most of the teams have been decided whether they're going to be in the playoffs or not. There's really only a question of one or two, which means, and I think this is something when we're taking a look, and we'll get to the Yankees and their their potential you know, trek to win 120 games, how many 100-win teams we're going to have this year. I think we're going to have at least two in the American League and several in the National League again. Um, if the Cubs, I don't know who the, have the Cubs have left to trade, but the Cubs, Pirates, Reds, Rockies, uh, Nats, and Marlins all start throwing bodies over the side of the boat, um, you're going to be playing minor league teams. Mm-hmm. And so if you're a mediocre team like the Diamondbacks, you're probably going to win a bunch of games. Because mediocre is better than terrible. And there's going to be a bunch of games where the Diamondbacks are going to be playing in the National League. And there are plenty of interleague games. There's going to be plenty of teams, you know, you know, cut and bait. You know, I think there's a real chance if the Diamondbacks don't trade Christian Walker, I think it would be smart for them to deal Bumgarner to A, get out of that salary. But also so many teams could say, hey, you know, Bumgarner is one of the best postseason pitchers of the last, you know, you know, few decades, mm-hmm. and you're not asking for a full season from him. You're just asking for a postseason from him. If I were a team like, if I were a team like Minnesota, 
I would I would push I would I would send a blue chip prospect. I would huh? send a top prospect. Huh? This re- no, no, let me explain to you why. Ooh. Again, this is an example of just of 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 uh, uh, something coming up as we're talking. Think about what this means to Minnesota. Why this year is so important. They're in first place. They have Carlos Correa, who who could opt out during the World Series parade. So they've pushed their ch- and the White Sox are disappointing. So like the Red Sea parting, the Central has opened up to them in a way that nobody was expecting, which means that they've got Correa for one year. He's having a very good year. We all know he's going to opt out. He would be stupid not to opt out. And he's going to get a massive contract. Maybe returning to the Twins, maybe returning to the Astros, maybe going to the Mets. I don't know where he's going to go. But the fact of the matter is, I know he's not going to the Mets, everyone. Don't write me. You know, I've gotten enough hate mail. But um, the Twins have to look at this year as, hey, everything's coming together for us in a way that we we were not expecting. And so to get a Bumgarner who is not the, the regular season Bumgarner, but saying you get someone like him for the postseason, someone who's stared down and has never blinked in the postseason. You can't point to a postseason where Bumgarner has not come up big. Even in 2016, where the Giants wound up losing to the Cubs, Bumgarner threw the complete game shutout in the wild card to, to beat the Mets. You know, he had the 2014 where he was brilliant. He had 2012 where he got some huge games. And as a rookie in 2010, October is his month. Yes, it's been a while since he's had one, but maybe he'd love to get back, you know, get back to the the uh, to the to uh, uh, spotlight. Yeah. So if you're Minnesota and you know everything's relying on this year, oh, we got this great prospect for a couple of years down the line. It's all like 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 the, like an eclipse is lining up for 2022. That if they have their bullpen is really good, they have an offense that's really good. They got one more big pitcher to put into that rotation to maybe pull off an upset over Houston or New York in the postseason. I roll them bones. Sully, before hopping on the pod, we are talking off air. You said you were sleeping all day, taking naps, and I'm not sure if you're fully awake yet. Why, sure where am I wrong? Why am I wrong about Minnesota? If I'm Mike Hazen and Minnesota's offering me a blue chip prospect for Massive Bumgarner, I'm turning down. I- I'm shutting up the phone if I'm Mike Hazen because I would feel like I'm taking advantage of Minnesota if I did that. If I'm Minnesota, I am not giving up a blue chip prospect for Massive Bumgarner. I'm telling you, if you take Madison Bumgarner away from Brent Strom, he's not going to be that effective. I've seen enough Madison Bumgarner the first two years, and he's been really good this year, but I think it's the Midas touch of Brent Strom that's keeping Madison Bumgarner together and just giving him this life right now that we see this season because uh, there was nothing those first two years in Arizona. Even those last couple of years in San Fran, you could see the decline of Madison Bumgarner, and players of Mad Bum's caliber of where he is in his career, they just don't go for blue-chip prospects. Like, that would just be an all-time fleece by the D-backs. Like, they traded Eduardo Espar last year for Cooper Hummel and some other prospect. Like, every time the D-backs make a deal, they get back, like, a terrible package. So, if we were somehow able to get a blue chip prospect from Madison Bumgarner, like I would get on my knees and start praying to my Kazen because that would, that would, that would be blasphemous for Minnesota to do something like that. I honestly just don't think it's even possible. So for D-backs fans, don't get your hopes up because if Madison Bumgarner gets traded, I promise you it would not be for anyone that's even probably a major league baseball player. Okay. Okay. What if they do this? <laughs> okay. okay. What if the twin, I think the twins are a perfect landing spot for Madison. What if they send like one or two decent prospects and included in that deal, they throw in a built bar. Now, let me tell you something. Ooh. Built bar has a new thing. This may put them over the top. We're going to call this the Bumgarner Special, the Coconut Brownie Chunk Puff. I can't believe I said those words in that order. By the way, that's what I'm going to do uh, tomorrow on Wordle. Those are going to be some of the w- words I throw in for Wordle. Uh, from the people who invented the healthy and the tasty, built bars come to the latest gift to your taste buds. And one that very well may pry away Madison Bumgarner from the Arizona Diamondbacks. You've tried the amazing coconut brownie chunk built bar. But guess what? Your friends at Built have given you coconut brownie chunk the puffs treatment. That's right. Coconut brownie chunk built bar. The flavor you love is a delicious 
chewy marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. It's like a fluffy cloud of coconut brownie goodness. Am I still asleep? Am I dreaming? No, but I have drooled on my pillow. And listen, they're good for you. They're low calorie. They're low sugar. They're high protein. And they're all deliciosos. Coconut bread and chunk puffs are here for only a limited time. Go to built.com and make sure you don't miss out. They're going fast. Miller's already ordered five boxes of them. Keep them coming. All built bars are made with collagen protein. And Miller, you know that the body absorbs that more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good, is good for you. The best part about built puffs is, of course, they taste amazing. But you can enjoy them guilt free because they're actually good for you. They're the perfect treat, perfect when you're craving, perfect when you need to satisfy your sweet tooth, or you need to strike a deal between the Minnesota Twins and the Arizona Diamondbacks from Madison Bumgarner. Delicious coconut, rich, sweet brownie, creamy marshmallow. Stop fantasizing. Built.com is your order. Use it to get your coconut brownie chunk built puffs right now. Go to built.com. Use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15. Built Bar. Okay. Let's uh, talk about um, let's talk about a couple other quick things here right now. Um, first of all, if the Yankees play 500 ball the rest of the way, they win 100 games. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like... It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They have you know if they play seven fifty ball. Now that's now that now that's hard to do. Mm-hmm. I will. I'm not, I'm not saying this is simple, and that would mean they would have to go like sixty two and twenty the rest of the year. Okay, Possible. it's it, that's not uh, that would be great. It's not outlandish. Okay, it's not like I'm saying if they go eighty and one, you know, they would have to really knuckle down and make sure that they don't uh, lose a single series. Don't go on any kind of a slump. If they go 62 and 20, they will finish with 120 wins this year. Okay? Okay. That's what's in grass, in their <laughs> grass. I don't think they're going to. Okay? I'm going to go out of limb and say this team is not going to win 120 games. That's but the fact lot. that I can even do that calculation and you go like, okay, that's not probable. But it is possible to go on a stretch like that. And especially if more – like. Again, we know the Yankees and the Astros are not only going to win their division, but, with, I mean, the Astros are probably going to finish better than the American League Central winner. I think we can agree on that. Mm-hmm. So that means the two American League teams that are going to get buys are going to be Houston and New York. Most likely. And it looks like there won't be another team with a winning record in the West other than Houston. Mm-mm. And as we brought up the other day, the Red Sox, Blue Jays, and Rays have to just basically be look at whoever's in second place in the Central and stay ahead of them. Right now, it's the Guardians, and um, although the Guardians won a big game against the Yankees on Sunday, but Byron Buxton, by the way, Byron Buxton is averaging three walk-off home runs a week. I, I, I may have made that stat up. But it sure seems that way. And every time I flip over, see a Twins highlight, it's they're they're throwing sunflower seeds and jumping up and down on home plate. They, there's so many walk off wins with Minnesota. I'll get to them in a second. Mm. But it you're going to see all the other teams in the league. Just again, they're going to cut bait. And so if the Yankees are going to continue to be playing lousy teams, could they go on a run where they don't lose more than 20 games the rest of the year? Yeah, the American League is kind of watered down where it's really not that great. Like, if I went to bet online and placed money on who's going to make the postseason, I'm thinking four teams out the American League East. Like, the top four teams you mentioned, I think they're all going to make the postseason. Um, so, it's going to be fun, that wild card race with the with the Rays, Red Sox, and Blue Jays to see um, just how it all unfolds. But for the Yankees, I mean, I watch a lot of basketball. I watched the Golden State Warriors when they won 73 games. They broke the all-time regular season record. But you know what happened that postseason, Sully? They lost the NBA Finals. So I want to have the same message for the New York Yankees. Don't worry about the regular season. Don't chase records, Sully. Don't burn yourself out in the regular season winning all these meaningless games because 
because guess what? It does not matter once you get to the postseason because you're going to have to face two teams that have had your number in the postseason in the last five years, in both the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox. And if you lose to either of those teams, you're going to have another insufferable offseason of Yankees fans just in your mentions. Aaron Boone, Brian Cashman, they're going to be calling for your head. You're going to have riots in the streets. So Yankees fans, it's going to be fun winning 120 games. But guess what? If you lose to the Red Sox or the Astros in the postseason, it will all be for waste. That's my message for Yankees out there. First of all, it was way too early to go into a bet online read. I was like, when <laughs> yeah. you said bet online, the now we're way too close. Like PTSD. To I went, we're way too close. I almost did it to get it out of the way. But um, remember, I mean, you brought up the Warriors who lost mm-hmm. that amazing game seven, and Cleveland finally got a championship, their first one. LeBron. Of any kind. For you, for LeBron there, the first one for any Cleveland team since the 64 Cleveland Browns um, pre-Super Bowl championship. Um, but remember that that Warriors team, we'll bring, I'll bring up two other ones. The, the you know, the Patriots having the perfect season yeah. and losing the Super Bowl to New York and the Mariners winning their 116 games in 2001 and losing to the Yankees in the ALCS. I mean, it... it the number of wins they piled up actually wound up making those years it hurts hurt more. more. It yeah. hurt more. You know, it's like, you know, if the Mariners had won, like, like the A's won a hundred something game and with a wild card team that year. Uh, you know, if, if they, if the Mariners had won like 105, you know, that would be bad, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as memorable of the fact that it had the highest, Oh, even going back further, the, um, I believe it was the the I'm going to do some of this off of memory, but the Cleveland Indians in 1954 finally beat the Yankees to go to the World Series, and they won. I think it was 110 games. Uh, I may I, I'm doing this from memory, but there was it was 110 something, and it was the most wins ever. And you know that's how you had because the Yankees also won 100 games that year. The Yankees won five straight World Series, and Cleveland finally got past them and went to the world series. And finally, New York was not going to win the world series that year. And do you know who won the world series that year? Who? New York, the giants, <laughs> uh, and the giants with the famous, uh, catch by Willie Mays, mm-hmm. not only beat the Indians, they swept them. And the giants were so, were such intense underdogs. It didn't even seem fair. They were on the same field as the Indians team and they swept them. I'll give you one last note about that. When in 1995, my father and I used to take baseball trips and we would go visit stadiums. And we were at Jacobs Field, which was brand new. It just opened the year before. And this was the year that the Indians won 100 games in the 144-game season after the strike. The Indians, it was the greatest team they've had in generations. The place was packed. And um, there was this the first time that everyone knew it was the first time the Indians were going to go to the postseason since that World Series sweep by the Giants in 1954. Mm. And I'm there with my dad. You know, you know, I'm not a Cleveland fan, but I was cheering him on. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm in the room for the home team. And I thought it was a great story. Cleveland's great again. And I had on, I think I had on. What was the the Tomahawk Sea? I hated the Chief Wahoo logo even back then, but mm-hmm. I used to have the Tomahawk Sea hat the, from the late 70s. I thought that looked pretty cool. And I was sitting there, and my father was there, and my father grew up a huge New York Giant fan uh, later towards the end of his life it, it, when we moved to the Bay Area, rabid San Francisco Giant fan. But he had his NY, his New York Giants hat that he had. And we were sitting in there, and, we, and we're making small talk with this, uh, this, this mother and daughter. And the mother was about my dad's age. And she was an old-time Cleveland Indians fan and everything. And my dad never mentioned the 54 World Series, never mentioned the fact that his team swept the Indians and all this stuff. And we had a very pleasant conversation. And then there was like a little lull in the game, like a pitching change. And the woman turned to my dad and she could not have been more pleasant we she we were talking about our trip and they were from the you know they're from shakers heights ohio da 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 a little low in the game and the woman turned around and gave my father a look that could kill mm. and and said i see your hat and then went right back and she was pleasant the rest of the game but there was a little bit of don't think you're sneaking that f wow. you by me 
Yeah, she was oh, on to it. She was. Oh, yeah, she was on to it. But I'm telling you, when the – so that, that's a great point. Like that Indians team, that Mariners team, you mentioned the Warriors, the Patriots, all those teams that had that huge record that they were going for the regular season made their collapse in the postseason even more of a long shot. Yeah, and you know? when you see a lot of those dominant regular season teams, you have question marks of – how battle-tested are they really when they mm -hmm. get to the postseason? Because we see them so dominant in the regular season. So for the Yankees, I think the motto of success that they kind of want to base it off of is maybe the 2018 Red Sox. Because that Red Sox team was, when you go back and look at it, there was literally no lull during the season where they gave you any question as to whether they're going to win the World Series or not. Because I don't think they ever had a losing streak longer than three games. And they might have yeah. had one three-game losing streak that whole season. They got to the postseason. There was moments where you're like, I don't, I don't know if the Red Sox are going to pull through here. And then every round, they were able to miraculously do it. And they just swept their way through the regular season, dominated the postseason. When you look they back, lost three like, postseason games. Three yeah. postseason games total. Yeah, but during in the moment, it felt like those series were maybe longer or tougher than you know in the moment. But when it was over, you're like, man, the Red Sox actually really handled that series. And the whole season, it kind of felt like that, where maybe it was tougher in the moment. But when you look back, you're like, really, the Red Sox just straight up dominated the whole 2018 season. And the same could be said maybe for this Yankees team in 20, uh, 2022. I think that's the model that they want to go off of, where you can be dominant in the regular season and then have it translate once you get to the postseason as well. And maybe you never actually have to be in a situation where – are you battle tested or not? Because maybe you're just so dominant and you're just so much better than the better than the other teams that you're just able to dominate your way through the entire season like the Red Sox did in 2018. Well, yeah, and and you know, if the Yankees continue playing like this, they are just gonna be the closest thing to a surefire bet to win yeah. the World Series. Yeah. And where are you gonna go if you're gonna make a bet? I think I'm gonna head to betonline.net, Sully. That's your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's Major League Baseball season, not the NHL playoffs like it says here on the copy. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores, and remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easy way to check in on your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online. That's where the game starts. I have to sneak in that story about my dad. I've always loved that story about my dad and, and that, that woman who, like, my, is my father's very subtle middle finger that he was giving, and the woman yeah. caught it. I, Thankfully, I she wasn't it. a narc and didn't, you know, expose you guys. Nah, no. Nah, it's Ohio. They're nice and <laughs> This is not a, this is the Yankee bleachers or Fenway the Park. Bleachers. I was going to say like Phillies, they'll, they'll expose yeah. you in a heartbeat over there. Hey, uh, there's a chance I may uh, fans of uh, Locked On MLB. There's a really good chance I may be going on location to what? Philadelphia. Maybe heading out to seeing a game between the Nationals and the Phillies. Live so pod? if anyone who's fan at at uh, at Citizens Bank Ballpark in August, I'll send more information about that. But everyone wants to stop by, maybe say hello. We're going to be doing a we're going to be doing a podcast from the stadium and check wow. it out. So we're going to check out uh, upcoming events there. I'm going to be trying doing some uh, podcasts from Dodger Stadium, from Angel Stadium, and maybe from AT&T Park and the Oakland Chase? Coliseum. What? Chase Field? What, can Arizona? I crash at your pad? Yeah, I got to crash count, at your buddy. pad with you I and I? Yeah. Yeah. Do a little odd couple thing going on yeah. there? Yeah, and then you could do Mondays with Miller right here. But I do want to say real quick, the Phillies ballpark, one of my favorites. I used to go there a couple times growing up as a kid. I think I had the best fan experience whenever I was going there as a child. So I love I've never the been there. Ballpark. I've never oh, really? been there. Yeah, okay. I've I only been to the vet. Atmosphere. I've been to the vet. Uh, uh, I, went, I saw the Mets play the Phillies at Veterans Stadium. Um, I miss – I, I still I still maintain they should have kept one cookie cutter park. Hmm. They should have kept one circular park because now that park would look unique. Mm -hmm. Now that park would have a would have a flair and character. The one I would have kept would have been St. Louis hmm. uh, because there was a you know there were several World Series that were played there. That you know Bob Gibson played there, Lou Brock, Ozzy Smith, Pujols, the McGuire Chase, there were a lot you know the World Series, the three World Series from the eighties. You know, a lot of great memories took place in that ballpark, St. Louis-wise. So, uh, and it, with the arches that they had in the outfield, it didn't just look generic. It felt like this was the stadium for them. But, um, but no, they had to build the new Bush Stadium, which I, you know, fine. But uh, I am looking. I, I, the vet was kind of cold and a little 
ugly and dirty, mm. but it felt very Philly. It felt kind of, <laughs> it felt like the docks that Rocky worked on in the opening of Rocky. You know, it felt very Philadelphia. It felt very, that's the part of like, you know, where you'd see Eddie Murphy in, uh, uh, in trading places, pushing himself along on the little cart. Yeah. I'm going to date myself as many references as possible, but those are two classic Philadelphia movies. Yeah. Trading places and Rocky. Rocky. Another great, Rocky. another great Philadelphia movie is 1776, whose last scene takes place on July 4th, 1776. I'm not a huge musical fan. I'm a huge Revolutionary War, American Revolution buff. I've read many, many books about it. And my favorite figure, my favorite two figures in the American Revolution are John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. Um, not the you know not the least of which they had the, they had the foresight for doing our for the foundation of the country and they were ahead of their times on something which you shouldn't be ahead of your times you should be this should never have been a question but in that era they were abolitionists mm. in an era where it was not the cool. uh, easiest time to be an abolitionist yeah. they were they were yeah. early in on that I can't say uh, <laughs> they probably wouldn't be progressives now but for the time they were. Uh, so salute to Adams and to Mr. Franklin. Uh, tomorrow is the anniversary of the signing of that document. Ah. Anyway, uh, Jefferson wasn't. Um, <laughs> uh, but back to back to baseball. Um, my pal Millard, hey, that's you me. are younger than me. Uh, slightly, 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 slightly. Um, you were born in the year of our Lord, 1998. 97 close 97 okay mm -hmm. so you were born so you've never lived in a world where the marlins were not a world series champion okay i got it mm -hmm. um so someone roughly your age is uh mr juan soto mm -hmm. who is an outfielder for the washington nationals now you're doing great you're, you're you host a podcast I uh try. you know you're you're affiliate you're 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 get you know you get paychecks from the Arizona Coyotes. Oof, um, yeah, a little bit. You know, they hooked yeah, the boy up. Yeah. Juan Soto has, this is now his fifth major league season. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been a batting champion. Uh, he has led the league in OPS uh, four times, or three times he's been in the top 10 of the MVP vote. Uh, he has a World Series ring. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about your life compared to his? Um, I don't know if it's as glamorous as his. I don't know exactly how he lives his life, but you know what? That's a lot of pressure. You know, I got a little pressure doing the podcast. I got listeners, but watching, you know, having yeah. 20,000 people in the stadium and then viewers on TV, that's too much. That's a, that's a different level. So, you know, what? I feel better being behind the mic right now. Yeah. Monso hit three home runs in the 2019 World Series. Yeah, I don't want to um, do that. Okay. Now, that. now I'm going to, I'm bringing this up for this reason. Okay. He's still a young dude, much like you. He's a young dude. Um, and the Nationals winning the World Series, we made a little hint about when Cleveland won the NBA title, what a huge moment that was for Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Nationals won, that was a huge moment for Washington fans who had not seen a championship uh, you know, since the Redskins, I think it was in 91 or 92. Forgive me, I don't know, Super Bowls as well as World Series. It was the first World Series title for a Washington team since the uh, the senators in tw 1924, uh, the Negro League team, the Homestead Grays, played their 1948 season championship season in Washington. So you can point to that, but even that's a long time ago. Um, so they've dismantled most of that Nationals team that won in 2019. Most of the players there are gone. Mm -hmm. Soto is there. And there was a lot of rumors of whether or not Soto would be trade bait. And now the rumor is coming that they're going to sign him to a deal that is going to keep him in Washington until the heat death of the universe. Okay. And um, I have some thoughts of that. I'd like to hear your thoughts of that first, because we may have some disagreements on this. But I want to know your thoughts of Soto being offered what is apparently a 12 or 13 year deal. 
Yeah, it seems like it might be around 13 for 425. It sounds like it's going to be a massive extension for Soto. He's 23 right now, so I might take him mm-hmm. to like his age 39 season. And overall, the idea of long term 36, it'll be 36. Or, uh, see, Sully, that's why you're the teacher, man. That's why, that's right. that's why I don't do. Yeah, so 36, right. that's not too bad of an age. They, they, a... they, they, they don't just let anyone into Cal State Fullerton. Okay. Hey, 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 the, I... It's the Harvard of Orange County. And they do almost let anyone into Arizona State, baby. Oh. That's where I went to school. Hey, forks up. But yeah, for Soto, I'm okay with a 13-year deal if you're that age. If you're 25 and younger, 13-year yeah. deal is okay. Because I think at 36, you can still be a productive player. Because I think most of the time when you hand out a 10-year deal, like if Judge is looking for like a 10-year deal, like those last three, four years on deal is going to be terrible when he's in his late 30s, early 40s. Because we've seen those deals like with Albert Pujols and other guys who are just like, get me out this contract at the end of Alex Rodriguez's of the world as well and so overall the idea of long-term deals is something that's not I'm not a huge fan of unless you're 25 or younger and Mm -hmm. I think for baseball because my thoughts are not just really on this you know pertain to Juan Soto it's about baseball in general because I think for baseball they need to maybe go the NBA route when it comes to contracts and maybe put a limit on how long you can sign somebody maybe you shouldn't be allowed to do 10 years maybe you can only do five to seven year maximum when it comes to players because one thing that I think baseball would benefit from is the drama and the narratives that we have during the season when it comes to contract situations and disputes because one of the great things about Aaron Judge's season is not just the fact that he's having an MVP year he's having an MVP year during a contract year when he can just walk away for the new from the New York Yankees and they won't get anything in return if that happens I think in baseball to increase the drama to increase the the you know just some of the 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 nature of the talking and the gossiping around the sport i think they need to do short term deals because once juan soto signs that 13 year deal there's pretty much no more juan soto's discussions uh you know except unless it's on the field but there's not going to be many off the field discussions there's not going to be any rumors or where is juan soto going to go next like that's a lot of the stuff that drives the nba and the nfl all that off season chatter that we discuss and for baseball like this past off season the free agent frenzy it was a great time mostly because we had the lockdown so All that happened really quickly, but there was also a ton of free agents, a ton of great players on the market, like the Freddie Freemans and the shortstop market. So I think if you have shorter contracts, we'll get better players on the free agent market. We'll get more offseason chatter and we'll just get more people talking about the sport of baseball, more eyeballs on the sport. And I think that's something that baseball needs. I love the rumors and I love the gossip when it comes to sports. And we just don't have that enough in baseball because of these freaking 15 year deals that people like to sign. I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted because I can see both sides of this. Uh, on the one hand, I I do like having the continuity of the stars staying with their teams. Mm-hmm. The Trout's going to be an angel. Votto's going to be a uh, a red. red. You know mm-hmm. that. Um, what are some of the other like big ones that um, you know? Obviously, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's tough off the top of your head. You're yeah, like, oh, you know, my guys do move, huh? But. Uh, but you do have moments like like um, Mookie Betts yeah. being dealt from the Red Sox to the Dodgers, which still drives me crazy that the Red I, Sox only became cheap skates. Uh, and you can have a player sign a big ass contract. Not sure if I'm allowed to say that yeah, word on this. <laughs> kind of but yeah, I, went, I went deep there. May have to throw in a beep there. Um, for yes. the Jim Carlos Stanton signed that gigantic contract yeah. extension with Miami, only to have him be flipped to the Yankees. Um, so I, I like having continuity of stars with their teams. I do. It does make the off season a lot less intense. I mean, re- just keep in mind in 1992, after the 1992 season, both Greg Maddox and Barry Bonds were free agents. Wow. The greatest pitcher and the greatest hitter of the 1990s were free agents at the same time. You know, a few years later, Randy Johnson was a free agent along with Kevin Brown. Now, before anyone laughs at me throwing Kevin Brown in there, Kevin Brown's peak was unbelievably high. I'm going to Google it. You, you, if you look at Kevin Brown, yeah, he, he signed a massive, at the time, massive contract with Los Angeles, and he wound up getting hurt. And a lot of people remember him as being the pitcher who choked in the 4 playoffs for the Yankees. But – his time with Texas and with the Florida, helping pitch the Marlins to the World Series title, and basically almost single-handedly pitching the Padres into the World Series in 1998. He was an unbelievable workhorse, and he was a free agent at the same time as Randy Johnson in his prime. You know, that was what you saw at that point. 
Manny Ramirez was a free agent a few years after that. Obviously, you had A-Rod as a free agent, Mike Mussina being a free agent. You did see a lot of the big market teams gobble a lot of those players up, but that did put a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of you know fan bases. San Diego and Miami get to the World Series. They're called Florida then, of course, we're going to correct me. And then they have to immediately dismantle the team because they can't afford it. Uh, I, there's a part of me that likes to see stars stick around for the continuity of it. I have a thing that says if you stay with one in the free agent area, if you stay with your team for 10 years, you can't ask for a minute after that. A fan base can't complain. Why are you? You, you, you gave us 10 years. After 10 years, you can go do whatever you want. Now, and, and I think teams kind of realized that the value that you're going to get, if you try to trade away a Juan Soto, for example, you're not going to get the value, Juan Soto's value back. I'm going to use, a, I'm going to use like a, a hypothetical. Let's say a team has someone like a Paul Goldschmidt, and they know they're not going to be able to afford wow. a Paul Goldschmidt. Wow. And then they wound up trading Paul Goldschmidt. You're never going to get the value back for Paul Goldschmidt. Could, could you understand a situation like that? I, I think I could understand it a little bit. I think that one's hitting a little bit close to home. It's why Do you I feel never... shivved? Do you feel shivved right now? I feel like I just took more than a shiv. I, I have like an axe in my back right now, Sully. So <laughs> you can you can continue with your analogy if you want, Paul Goldschmidt. I do, and I think that a team like Washington realizes that whatever they try to pay to replace Juan Soto's production, uh, they'll never get back in return. Yeah. Also, taking a peek at the Cubs, the Cubs had a team that won the World Series. They did, I thought they were going to keep someone. I thought they were going to keep Bryant. I thought, Brian, I thought they were going to keep Bryant as, here's the guy you can cling to to come back, you know, or, or either Bryant or Baez. I thought they were going to keep one of those two. And they didn't keep anybody. They just put two sticks of dynamite on the team and blew them up. And the Nats are going to stink for a little bit. Mm -hmm. They need to have someone for the fans to cling to. The Giants did that pretty well. They kept Posey and Belt and Crawford around for the you know, fans said, this team stinks, but I, I recognize them. Soto is going to be an elite player for the next five or six years. And if the team is smart, it should take about three or four years to rebuild the team. And yeah. Soto will still be a productive player. And because there's a universal DH, which you know I fought against, but it's there. I'm going to stop screaming against the tides. He could probably continue to be a solid hitter at DH, provided he doesn't have any catastrophic injuries for, you know, the next, you know, towards the end of the contract. And for Nationals fans, they said, there's our guy. They, that guy helped us win the World Series. So I, I, I understand why they would. A judge is a different animal altogether. Mm -hmm. um, because he's older. older. Yeah, he's, he's older. older and he is has had more injuries. Um, if he leads the Yankees to the World Series title and, and shows up next year as a Met uh, or a Red Sox, yeah, that'd be tough to swallow. But he would also, a 10 year deal with the Yankees would mean a hell of a lot more than a 10 year deal with the Red Sox because he has so much good money that even by the end of his career, if, if he's broken down, that was part of the deal. Like, if Pujol signed a giant contract with the Cardinals and broke down the way he did with the Angels, he had so much goodwill in the bank with St. Louis fans, mm -hmm. they would still be cheering him on the way Yankee fans were cheering on uh, Mattingly at the end of his career and the way the Giant fans were cheering on Lincecum. You know, that there was so much goodwill in the bank that, that it, you were cheering because he reminded you of it. Yeah. But, like, when Sandoval signed with the Red Sox and he showed up looking like Jabba the Hutt, and one year finished the season with more belts broken from his belly than base hits. Uh, yeah, there was no goodwill in the bank in Boston. So yeah, it's kind of like uh, Dustin Pedroia. He's a good example for Red Sox. Right. Yeah. By the end of his career, he was constantly injured. But if he showed up to pinch hit, he would get a ten minute long standing ovation because of all the goodwill he had yeah. in the bank. Because you're still collecting those checks, even though he was playing like three games a year those final three years. Yeah, but it wasn't his. I mean, he was hurt. Like, his, oh, he, but... he, his ankle snapped. <laughs> yeah. You know. But he was like, but, he kept doing the. I'm gonna come back, guys. Up oh, here goes yeah. another surgery. I'm out again. Yeah, I I think I think a ten year deal with Soto I think would work because I, I you know even a thirteen year deal he'll still be in his mid thirties and probably be an effective DH. 
Uh, but I think you're right about Judge. And again, Judge is going to get what he wants to get because he's a recognized. And the Yankees can't suddenly play, you know, cry poverty. And removing Judge from this lineup could be disastrous. Yeah. And- which means he's in such a good place for negotiations. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah. you know, if he signed a 10 year deal by the end of that 10 years, he'll be like in a full body cast. Yeah, it wouldn't be good. And we'll see if the Red Sox are serious about going after him. I'm not too sure I believe in those rumors. If I was to offer Aaron Judge a contract, it would be probably in like the six to seven year range. I'll probably be comfortable with the number um, in that range. But overall, like you were talking about, like I, I've talked about a nauseam on pods, like trading your star player, like the science of trying to figure out which prospect is going to develop into another MLB star is the hardest science I think in sports. I think it's harder than trying to pick a quarterback or trying to get another LeBron James, like trying to figure out which player and all these prospects, which of these blue chip prospects is going to hit. Like you look at all these trades in the past 10 years where the guys trade their star players, like basically every return, those prospects don't really amount to anything. They definitely don't turn into the guy that you once traded. So I think it's better just to go, um, when it, instead of doing long-term co- contracts, let's get maybe a limit in here because I think you could still have the guys like the Joey Vados and the Mike Trouts who stay with a team throughout their entire career. They just have to keep re-signing those deals, keep re-signing those five-year contracts, and yeah. they, they could keep coming back. And then I think that would also put more onus on the actual franchise to get better every time it's getting closer to that renewal because imagine every five years Mike Trout had to re-sign a contract. All of a sudden, if the Angels see that deadline looming again and they're still not good, now all of a sudden Mike Trout could be like, hey, Hey, I might have to leave this situation because I've been here for 12 years. You guys haven't gotten me one freaking number one ace. And now it's 12 years in the leagues and everyone's wondering, am I really the, 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 the great say, Hey kid that everyone says that I am. So I think if we went short term deals, it would also put more onus on the franchises to actually get good and get competitive while they still have these stars on their roster. Well, I'm all for short term deals, but I have just signed a long term deal oh. with locked on to team up with my buddy, Miller Thomas at least once a week. And he's got a great podcast. It's called Locked on Dimebacks. Our podcast is called Locked on MLB. Thanks for making our podcast your first listen every day. Now, we're going to be talking this week. Um, we're going to be bringing on the stars of Locked on Red Sox are coming on. Ooh. And I maybe, whether it's this week or maybe next week, I'm working on talking to a couple of the people who are working behind the scenes to bring Major League Baseball to Nashville. So that's going to be a co- topic of conversation coming up either later this week or next week, Expansion. pending our – what is that? Expansion? Oh, any way we can. Any way oh. we can. Oh. Then, by the way, make your second listen locked on MLB Prospects host Lindsey Crosby. He's a prospect encyclopedia. He's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Hey, uh, it's the 3rd of July. Yeah. Happy happy third of July. Uh and Miller Thomas, you can follow you where? Follow me on Twitter at career Thomas24 for my personal account, or look up Locked On Dimebacks both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And of course, follow us on YouTube as well, Locked On Dimebacks and all your podcasting platforms. Boom. And I'm we're at Locked On MLB Pods on both Twitter and Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, right there. Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Talking about 100-win seasons and getting value for your franchise players. This has been the Locked On MLB, Locked On Diamondbacks crossover with your pal Sully and Miller Thomas. And we're going to fist pump and call it a day. What do you say, buddy? Fist pump.